Hello, I'm Kurt Steinbrook, pastor of Faith Lutheran Church in Wesley Chapel, Florida, and we are going through the book of Romans a few verses at a time and just digging into it and getting everything we can out of it because God gives us so much to learn in the book of Romans, so much to develop our theology, as well as just to know him and to have our faith built up by him. And so today we're going to be looking at Romans 9, 4 to 5. And before we do that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy, that uh, your mercies are new every every morning. And we need it every morning, Lord, because we're sinners. But we know your grace is greater than our sin. Lord, help us to cling to that, to trust your grace over our works. Lord, we pray that you would also be with us here in this time as we read your word and study it, that you would bless us to understand it to receive it as truth, and to grow in our faith and be drawn closer to you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, let's start by reading our passage for today, which is Romans 9, 4 to 5. Let me share this with you. All right, here we go. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. So we're continuing this section of Romans 9 through 11, where Paul is addressing the, the issue of what's going on with the Israelites, who were uh, promised the Messiah, but now are rejecting the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And he began by talking about how much he cared about them, how much he desired for them to be saved. And now he's reminding us that Israel was greatly blessed. And this is reminiscent of what we saw in Romans 3, chapter, or Romans chapter 3, verses 1 to 2. Let me share that with you real quick. Uh, which said, then what advantage has the Jew? Or of what value is circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. And so there he was uh, dealing with the question, because he had said that you're not going to earn your salvation. So they said, what good is it to be a Jew? Well, there were a lot of advantages. And now here in Romans 9, we get into several of those advantages that they were given. So what were some of the adoption, uh, some of the benefits that they had? And there he lists six, uh, or maybe seven, depending on how you want to categorize things. But let's take a look at them. So the first one that he talks about is adoption. He says, they are Israelites, to them belong the adoption. Now, this is a term that you really don't see in the Old Testament. It's a, it's a different concept than what's shown in the Old Testament, but the Old Testament does have that concept of being the chosen people, that God had chosen Israel. And here, now, Paul is using the language similar to what he's used when he spoke of, of the Christians being adopted as children of God, uh, because of the fact that it wasn't their doing that caused that causes it, you right? As Christians, we aren't the ones who somehow make ourselves worthy of God choosing us. Rather, God chooses us and makes us his children because of his own purpose and his own love. And in a similar way, God chose Israel. And he didn't choose them because they were a great nation. He didn't choose them because of something about themselves, but rather because it was his purpose. And it was his love. And in fact, uh, he specifically says that at one point, that he says, I didn't choose you because you were a great number, because you weren't. You were the smallest of all nations. I didn't choose you because you were mighty, because you were weak. You know, I chose you because, well, I chose you. And that's that's how it works. Um, and so, you know, this is bringing us back to that idea that Israel was the chosen people. They were adopted by God, not because of anything of themselves. Uh, but they are seen as having that relationship 
with God. And that you do see in the Old Testament, the idea of Israel being God's son, uh, that he is their father. And so the adoption concept here emphasizes that relationship uh, that was due to God's action, not to theirs. So it says, they are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption. The next thing it says, the glory. Now, contextually, this does not include the go the glory that is to come. So um, this isn't speaking of that heaven uh, experience that we talked about uh, just at the end of Romans 8, where we'll be glorified. Um, but rather, Paul is lamenting that I could, you know, because Paul is lamenting that these Jews are not being saved. So this is not talking about that, but rather it's referring to the many times that Israel got to experience the glory of God. Uh, like, for example, on Mount Sinai, when God literally descends onto the mountain, the mountain is uh, covered in fire and smoke and clouds and, and God is there. Like they got to experience that, you know, or you think about uh, God being in the temple and uh, the temple being filled with his glory. Uh, he led them by a cloud by day, by fire by night. You know, and even you think of the the mighty works of God, whether in Egypt or uh, in the taking of the Holy Land or various ways uh, throughout the experience of Israel. They got to experience that. They saw God at work in magnificent and miraculous ways. And so they were able to experience the glory of God, both in his uh, expressed presence, but also then in these magnificent ways. Then it continues on. So it's they were Israelites um, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, and now the covenants uh, that here you have where God enters into a covenant with the people of Israel or uh, the uh, the fathers of, of Israel or uh, the leaders of Israel. So we have the Abrahamic covenant where God promises to make Abraham a uh, the father of many nations uh, and many peoples, more, more than you can count on the, the sands of the seashore. Um, you have the Mosaic covenant that God enters in with Israel to make them his chosen people. You have uh, the covenant he makes with David. Uh, where he says that you know your line will uh, out of your line will come the Messiah will be a ruler that will uh, rule for all time, and so you have these covenants that were made to Israel, which is a pretty amazing blessing. Uh, it continues on to say the giving of the law, the giving of the law, and of course we know this is. Uh, they were given the law at Mount Sinai to Moses, and then he presented it to the people. And this is a great blessing. It's a great blessing. Uh, the Jews would, saw this as a great blessing. In fact, sometimes they interpreted uh, this as being like, well, you know, we have the law. The rest of y'all don't have anything. And they kind of saw it as a source of pride. But it is a great blessing. And we see this uh, built out. Uh, in Romans, where even though Romans pushes back on the idea that the law is somehow a means of salvation, it, it dismisses that, but it still concludes in Romans 7 that the law is good, and it's holy, and it's from God. And so this is another blessing that Israel had. Uh, continues on to say the worship, the worship, uh, or uh, you could translate that as the temple service. Now, you may hear this, and only think of it primarily as what the people did, you know, the, the, the offered sacrifices, they would pray, they would give offerings and, and things like that. However, the Old Testament often refers to the temple as the place where God promises to hear the people and to respond to their needs, to bless them, right? And this is a confusion that we still have today, where we think of worship sometimes as this thing that we do for God. I am going to worship God and that this uh, is somehow something that, that God either needs or desires or whatnot. But um, the understanding, especially that we have here uh, in the Lutheran church, is that worship is really more about what God is doing for us. That when we go to worship today, that we go to hear his word that we go to receive uh, his 
his forgiveness, to to pray to him, to to ask of what we need uh, from him, uh, to do all you know, to receive the many blessings that God is giving to us, to to receive communion, to receive His body and blood, and then as a part of worship, yes, we respond with thanks and praise, but the primary actor of worship is God, and the primary actor of worship. Uh, in the Old Testament was God as well. The people would, yes, they would bring sacrifices or offerings or whatnot, but God is giving his word. He is giving forgiveness. He is listening to the needs of the people and responding to them. And so this is, uh, it's a blessing for them to be able to have that access to God and to be able to receive his blessings in this way. And the last thing that we have listed there in this sentence is the, the promises the promises of God. And so God has made many promises, all of them he fulfills. Uh, and so this would include the promise uh, to Abraham, the promises that he made to the people of Israel about the uh, the land that they would have. Uh, there were various promises that God gave, especially the promise of the coming Messiah, who was Jesus Christ, who he has now fulfilled uh, prior to this letter being written. You know, Jesus coming and living and then dying and rising again for the salvation, not only of the Jews, but for all people. But they were the ones to receive that promise. They were the ones to whom God gave the promise through the, through the prophets and uh, through the, you know, through the books of the Old Testament. So you have these six benefits that kind of list out the many blessings, the many benefits that there were to being an Israelite. They had all the, all the privilege, if you want to use the language of today, right? God had had given them everything here. And then it even continues on to say to them belong the patriarchs. So in addition to those six benefits, Israel has the patriarchs. They have Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Jacob's sons who are the, the founders of the 12 tribes. You know, they, they have those things that God has given them. And then, of course, according to the flesh, it says, is Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, Jesus Christ himself, who, who came through Israel. Now, the, this text here is very uh, quick to make it clear that uh, while he says that to them belong the patriarchs and Christ, that he's, you know, it clarifies that this is a, from their race according to the flesh. In other words, it's not saying that they have the salvation of God, but rather that it was through them that uh, it, that Jesus was a Jew, that Jesus descended from Abraham, that Jesus came to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles. So according to the flesh, uh, according to their uh, descendants, according to their blood, Christ came through them. So they have all of these things, all of these things. And yet we see even in the midst of all of this, that so many of them uh, just miss the Messiah. They they rejected him. They he didn't come the way they wanted, and they didn't believe. And that's the lament that uh, Paul is having for them. That's the anguish that he has for them is that they are after all this time and all the promises of the Messiah and all the other things that God has given them. That when it finally comes down to the big moment when the Messiah comes. They miss it. They miss it. Now, this is also a, an interesting passage here, a fascinating passage, because the passage reminds us at the very end, and I'm going to bring it back up here just for our, our reference, because we haven't seen it for a while. Uh, to them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. That this passage is sure to remind us that Jesus is the Christ. He's the anointed one, the Messiah, the promised one, but also that he is God. He is God. Um, and that's something that, unfortunately, the Jews, as they were hearing about Christ, they rejected that idea. They rejected that Jesus was God. In fact, as we, we read through the Gospels so often, the anger of the, the uh, scribes and the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders uh, is stoked 
when Jesus claims to be God. And they pick up on the things that he's saying. And they, that's when they start grabbing stones and, and start plotting to kill him. Because he would dare to say that he is God. But he is. And in addition to that, he is our Savior. He is the one who has come to die and be raised again for us. And so despite all of the blessings, all of the benefits that Israel had, they were missing. But this is something that I would hope that you and I, we don't miss. That we see Jesus for who he is. That he is the promised one. That he is the savior. That he is God. Who brings our redemption. Who reconciles us with God. And who then brings us into the, the full glory of God upon his return. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, have a wonderful day. Uh, God bless. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. And I will see you tomorrow. God bless.